Just wanted to tell you that. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and, and thank Illinois you. Illinois Limousine Association. Thank you for attending our, our coffee get together in the morning. I don't have my coffee yet, but I'll get it soon. Um, Paul, you have some housekeeping yeah. stuff you want to pick up on? Yes. Okay. So good morning. Um, we are recording the meeting, if you didn't notice. Um, and that is so uh, it'll be available on our YouTube channel after this meeting. So we will send you the link. Um, if you're not talking, put yourself on mute. And uh, um, and that way uh, we don't disturb everybody else. And I will uh, keep my eye on this hearing. Uh, if you have any questions during any of the discussion, go ahead and put them in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat box. And uh, let's have some fun. That's it. I'm ready. Back to well, you, Okay. Hey, we, well, once again, I want to welcome everybody. We hope that these sessions we put together have some value. Um, we believe they do. Um, you guys can be the judge of it. I'd like to start out by introducing our board. We have Kaya Armigan with Flash Limousine, Beth Cox with Cox Livery, uh, Paula, everybody knows Paula, Chicago Coachworks, James Jordan with Lux Limousine, Lynn Kappas with um, Galaxy Limousine, Michael McDaniel, McDaniels with Shriver Insurance, Jay Pearson, new member, Century Business, um, Tracy with Windy City and Brian Sheely with Epic Limo. Um, uh, this meeting was sponsored by Berkshire Coach and Nationwide Bus Sales, which has been great sponsors of the Illinois Limousine and Bus Association for many years now. We can't thank them enough for their support. Um, Troy, you're, you're, you're on the uh, call. Troy would like to kind of bring you up the date on where Berkshire is at. Troy, you want to take it? much good morning everyone thank you for your time and consideration today Hello, with Jason Tours. I, uh, the really, meeting. I'm really just going to take a few minutes to talk about the new next line of executive products introduced by Forest River Bus which is Federal Coach uh, most of you realize back in fall of last year Forest River Bus completed the acquisition of Rev Group so the federal brand is nothing really new um, however it lacked identity and product continuity. So we've moved that to Elkhart, Indiana, the same facility as the Berkshire Coach. It's built around the same principles as Berkshire Coach as most of you are accustomed to, and that is it's loaded with product features that would be considered options that are now standard. The real benefit of the federal is with the startup of the industry as it is today, we have decided to allow that product to provide an opportunity to customize the fleet to a greater extent, provide flexibility. So basically the service that you're providing you can either um, increase the option load if you'd like to, to be even higher content or lower. Now, there's a certain level of expectations that we have for a luxury brand, as we all know. However, I think there are opportunities to provide vehicles with uh, different option content. It's built to last. It's backed by the industry best five-year, 100,000-mile warranty. Uh, there seemed to be some confusion on that in the past. Just like Berkshire, it's five years, 100,000 miles, whichever comes first, everything that we do to the vehicle. The chassis warranty is, as the OEM chassis supplier stated, but on our side of it, it's a five-year, 100,000-mile warranty. And it's backed by an experienced and dedicated national dealer network, very similar to what we've done with Berkshire Coach. Models, we have a 24-foot, 28-foot. Those are on an E40, 350, 450 a 34 foot, which would be a 550, and then a 40, 42 foot Freightliner. All passenger rear luggage, uh, fold away seats, ADA packages, full gamut. What we're trying to do with this is offer a luxury interior gray package or black package, black interior. Uh, we've come up with all new fiberglass exterior look, uh, aerodynamic skirts, front rear caps, LED lighting, all that good stuff. What we really are trying to focus on is what is necessary for each particular contract or service you're providing. So the panoramic sky view window with all the automotive uh, thermoformed interiors are considered options now where you can choose that. Frameless windows, various AC uh, or HVAC systems, ducted rooftops to free blows, overhead luggage, uh, different flooring, fast luxury, luxury seats, audiovisual packages, et cetera. And it's all built by an experienced workforce, as you all know, here in Elkhart, Indiana. 
um, backed by Forest River Bus. And I think most all of you know that we are a Berkshire Hathaway company. So that is trying not to bore you, but I do want to emphasize that we are, in light of everything, we are expanding our executive brand and looking to grow <laughs> and excited for what we see happening right now. A minute, Paul, I hope that worked. <laughs> it certainly did. You know, I, as I'm listening to you, for, you know, I think, I think it might be time for a tour soon of the, for the membership. Maybe we can talk about that for the fall. I think that was a great experience when we did that the year before. Um, yes, and we're, we're in a facility of probably three times the size now too. I know, so I'm really looking we, forward. We would love to have you. Excellent. Are, are, you, uh, are you guys building underfloor storage at all or didn't executive but, have that? Yes, on the Freightliner product we are, yes. Okay, very um, good. The, I, this is just a weird question, but how has the does the semiconductor shortage affect the E450 F, you know, the E series chassis and the F series chassis and whatnot? Yes, it, it's a very fluid situation right now. And um, just as you've seen in the national news, we're, we are on the phone with Ford and uh, all our chassis suppliers every day. Um, not a lot of good information other than it's not good. <laughs> I just I just didn't know with the commercial chassis because everything I read it's more of a fuel consumption issue. And I didn't know how that applied to commercial chassis. Yeah. Uh, you've probably seen in the news we have several 550s built just sitting at the Kentucky Speedway. Um, they were built and then the chips were removed and put back into new production models to get those down the line. So it's a uh, best way I can say it's a very fluid situation right now. Any other questions for Troy? Okay, without further ado, Tracy, you wanna Thank you, Troy. introduce our topics and move us forward? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Troy, and thank you to you, your team, the company uh, for always uh, supporting our industry and supporting the association. It is greatly appreciated. Um, it was good to see you, it's been a long time. Uh, so yeah, our first topic today is advocating for your, for your industry. And what does that mean? What does that mean to advocate and to work with the industry members in order to, to solve issues that are affecting the industry? And if they affect the industry, then as you all well know, it affects your business, which then affects your family. Um, why is it important to have a voice? You know, and, and in order to have a voice, why is it so important to have those relationships? You know, I think going through the pandemic that many of us have learned how important it is and was, or how important it was and is today to have a relationship with your bank. And I, I cannot stress enough with all the work that I've done with the ILLBA as well as NLA is how important it is to have a relationship with your local legislators as well as city and state, um, even on a national level. Um, so as we were talking and getting ready for this webinar, you know, I, I think we had to check ourselves and, and ask ourselves, what is the reason to have an association? What is it that the association is supposed to do for its members? So of course we have education and, and we, we investigate and we research and we find uh, education and resources in order to provide for our membership and to help them with their businesses um, and to help them manage their businesses or attract more business. Um, but besides the education and the resources, it's also important for us to bring members together in order to share experiences, to share knowledge, um, as well as to be able to network with each other. Um, that is so extremely powerful. But I think one of, the, one of the items that an association is responsible for, and I think it falls by the wayside until there is an issue, and that is to have your finger on the pulse of what is happening in government, what's happening on your local level, what's happening on your state level, what's happening on your national level. And for those reasons, because by the time that we as operators, not members of the association, but by the time we as, as operators, by the time we find out that something is going on on a local level or state level, it's usually too late. Like that bill is being ready, it's, it's getting ready to pass and voted on and they haven't heard from our industry. Um, 
So I think we need to pay more attention to that. And I think as an association, we need to talk a little bit more of what it means to advocate and work together as an industry, not as competitors, not as individual operators, but to work together as an industry so that our local and state legislators, they know who we are. They know that the livery industry exists. Um, we're not the taxi industry. We are not the rideshare industry. We are not the bus industry. We are our own industry and they simply do not know that. Um, and we've been learning that over the years. Um, so unfortunately it does seem to fall on a few different people within the association. I, I think several of you also see it on the National Association that it still falls on a handful of people. Um, and and I, th I think a lot of members think, oh, I'm too small. You know, I have a small business and it doesn't make a difference. Um, and that couldn't be further from the truth. If you're a one car operator, 10 car operator, or if you own hundreds of cars, your voice is the exact same. Um, and I think we need to get that message across because the more voices that we have, the more serious that they take us when we walk into their office and we talk to them and let them and educate them about our industry and how we operate. And by this new bill that's being passed, this is how it's going to affect us. Um, it purely comes down to education. And if there's always one or two people, the same people walking in issue after issue, they don't take you as seriously. But when they start seeing, you know, the small operator walking in and they too employ you know, two or three different employees and they make a difference within their community, that definitely makes a difference. Um, so really quick, you know, before we, we go on to our speakers that we have invited is, I just wanna share a couple of examples or a few examples that just with the ILLBA, what we've been through, I've been with the association for 24, 25 years now. Um, one of the first items that I remember us going through was back maybe 18 years, 20 years ago, uh, when the city tried to regulate us as the taxi industry. They thought we were one in the same and they wanted to put all of the regulations that are that is currently on the taxi industry, they wanted the exact same for us. And I just remember going into all of those different meetings and just letting them know, no, we are different than taxi and this is how we are different. And they simply didn't know. Um, and I just think back like, oh my gosh, can you imagine we'd be regulated and we'd have meters and we'd have to have all of these approvals by the city if we didn't go in, be persistent and talk to them and educate them. Um, and because of those, you know, like I said, that was 18 or 20 years ago. And throughout then we've constantly have been talking to city officials of, you know, our different challenges. One of them being, how many of you remember when it used to take us three, four, five months to put a chauffeur on the road because of the, because of the class that they had to take, because of the testing, the background tests, and then they had to be approved by the city. And that used to be a three to five month process. That's insane. How can somebody not work for three to five months because they're waiting on the city? And so throughout the last 10, 15 years of educating the city and letting them know how insane this is, um, our very own Paula has been able to have her own class approved by the city. And today it takes two to three weeks to have a chauffeur on the road. And that, that came about only because of all of those different meetings that we've had with the city. Um, so that was definitely a win for us. Uh, one, one of the other ones was back in 2002. So think about how long this has been. 2002 was the last time that the MPEA tax and the ground tax has been increased. So I don't think we have any city people on here, air, airport people on this call, but um, you know it's coming up that it's due that those taxes are going to have an increase at some point in the near future, um, knowing that 2002 was the last time. So when those taxes were increased, we were definitely having meetings with the airport and having meetings with the city and, and they definitely wanted them increased higher than what we are paying today but because of all of those meetings and because of the education, we were able to keep them at the rate that we're paying today, which was far better than what they had first proposed. And again, had we not had those meetings, we'd be paying much more in each one of those taxes. Um, one other one that I wanna bring to your attention and I think it's been forgotten about was about 12 years ago, um, each one of you, when you buy a vehicle, you don't have to pay the sales tax on that vehicle. Well, about 12 years ago, the state passed where we would have to pay that sales tax. And because we went on the state level and we joined in with some other industries, 
we were able to be included where we could be tax exempt and not have to pay that sales tax. So imagine the tens of thousands of dollars that has saved every single one of you due to that advocacy and working together and having a voice on the state level to be included because they simply forgot about our industry. And we had, we had to educate them and let them know why we needed to be included because we're much the same as the other industries they were including. Um, so a little bit later, um, once we hear from our speakers, we're gonna talk about the current issue that we're facing, um, the security guard ordinance. Uh, we are in the, the heat of it right now. They have a city council meeting on Thursday that we're hoping to be able to speak um, to, to the council and let them know our concerns. Um, but the city, just because throughout the entire period of COVID, we continued to meet with the city. And now that they want tourism back, they're asking us, what is it that we can do for your industry so your businesses can, can, can come back? And how do we bring back tourism? You know, one of the first things we said was, <laughs> you need to get rid of the security guard. How can you expect us to sell tours and, and people from out of state to come to Chicago? And then we have to tell them, even though you're with your family on the van or the bus, or you're with your executive coworkers, you need to have a security guard to protect yourselves from each other and to protect the city from you. So how do you explain that? Um, and again, they just don't realize that they're affecting school trips um, executive travel, anybody in a bus, they think they are only addressing the party buses and the drinking and the bad behavior. And we're like, no, you're affecting school kids going to a museum. Per your ordinance, you need a security guard. And they don't realize it. So, you know, for the past six years, we've been educating them on it. And the city finally said, okay, we're going to relax it. We're going to allow the chauffeur to be the security guard. Simply all they expect is for that person to make a phone call, nothing else. Um, however, we need it to pass. We need our aldermen to vote for it and, and to be able to relax, to relax this ordinance so that we don't need security guards. So that's something that we've been the last two weeks now, we've been having several meetings with the city. They're trying to have another one with us today. Um, but on Thursday is when, I don't know if they vote for it on Thursday or they definitely address it and talk about it as well as other industries like restaurants and hotels and how do they open now that Chicago is open. Um, so with that being said, uh, we are fortunate today to have uh, two association executives who have joined us today. Um, we welcome Jason Sharanow, who is the president of the Limousine Association of New Jersey, and Sarah Eastwood Richardson, executive director of the Greater California Livery Association. And we invited them to, they have had many, many years of being involved in association work as well as they've been heavily involved with the advocacy efforts of each of those associations. Um, so we just want them to share their experiences, what works well, you know, where the challenges lie. Um, so Jason, I'll start with you, Jason, and maybe give a little bit of background with your association, why you feel associations are important, and then maybe give us one or two examples of major advocacy efforts that you have undertaken in the recent years. Perfect. Thank you so much for uh, having me join. Uh, it's great to see everyone uh, on the call today. Uh, you know, as Tracy started off in, in part of her um, announcement before, the advocacy for sales tax alone uh, on the purchase of vehicles, that's something that we've gone through here in the state of New Jersey, and we've been exempt from uh, now for many, many years. That could not have been undertaken without the entire support of our association, uh, making our voices heard uh, in Trenton, which is our state capital, where, where you know that's where everything comes out of. And uh, the sales tax savings alone, if you look at a company like mine, that there are years that we're, we're buying 25 vehicles in a year. What the sales tax savings alone more than pays for uh, my New Jersey association dues, my NLA dues, uh, and, and likely my kids' preschool, um, <laughs> when you think about it. Um, it. It adds up to a real number. Um, but that couldn't be done without everyone's support. Uh, and when we show up in Trenton, I go with a list of members. And they don't ask me how many cars, how many employees. I just 
it, it, it's a numbers game of numbers of companies that are members of our association. So when I say I represent 140 member companies that belong to LANJ, the reality is, is that of the 140 companies that belong to LANJ, we represent probably 90% of the vehicles that are on the road. So when you look at the members of my association, I have Empire, I have uh, what was Flight Time, now RMA, um, I have uh, a GEM, I have Concord. So I have some of the larger operators uh, in the state that represent the bulk of the vehicles on the road. So we have a very, very strong representation um, as an association. But again, when we show up, we're 140 member companies. We're not talking about the thousands of vehicles we represent. We're 140 member companies. Um, and that, that you know, resonates very, very strongly with the legislators that we talk to. Uh, keeping in touch with the legislators and attending political events. Um, I'm going to one uh, tomorrow night for the vice chair of the labor committee. The item that I'm going to talk about with him is you got us, New Jersey needs to vote to stop the, the $300 federal stimulus as other states have done. Um, I don't know if I'm sure that many of you are facing the same challenges that we are here in New Jersey and getting chauffeurs back on the road. Yeah. Um, New Jersey's unemployment right now, if you were able to collect the maximum, you were north of $700 a week in unemployment. And then you're adding an additional 300 on top of that. So these chauffeurs are getting thousand dollars a week to sit home and not get back behind the wheel. So that's something that we as an association are advocating for right now uh, to stop um, with the federal stimulus. We need to get that stopped. So they're back down to regular unemployment and then hopefully the chauffeurs will see the benefit of getting back behind the wheel and getting back to work. Um, and stop collecting, um, you know, the unemployment because we all have work. I mean, I don't know anybody right now who doesn't have work for their chauffeurs to get back on the road. It may not be at full steam. You may not be able to give somebody um, a full schedule like you used to, um, but it certainly seems like there's enough uh, to get everybody back working. So as an association, we just keep pushing for things like that. What else did we go through recently? Um, sales tax on service. That's something that LANJ single-handedly was able to get removed from um, the sales tax on service. That was a huge win for our association. We had it, we, they took it back, they put it back on, and then we fought against it again. Um, and, and we were able, we were successful in getting them to remove the sales tax on service because the taxis are not collecting it. The TNCs were not collecting it. One of the things New Jersey has always done, and, and I've always said this whenever I've ever spoken to any legislator, is all we want is parity. I'm not asking to be treated better. I'm not asking for them to be treated worse. I want all platforms to be treated equally. And that's what we've done as an association. And that's what we advocate for, is just treat us fairly. Treat us like you're treating everyone else. If the taxis don't have to collect tax, neither do we. If the TNCs have to collect an airport fee, we'll collect it as well. And that's something that was just imposed, uh, the Port Authority in New Jersey. And this is something that, again, LANJ negotiated along with the New York associations, the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey. So any trip going to JFK LaGuardia and Newark Airport, there's now a $2.50 airport fee that went into effect uh, in April. Um, so any of you that are sending work out east, um, you're now going to be subject to the $2.50 fee that the operator locally will be collecting and then charging you back for. Um, that's a fee that we negotiated down from what was originally proposed that $5 went to four, and then we got it down to $2.50. Um, once again, as an association, we showed up in force, making the calls to the legislators, which ultimately went to the Port Authority and said, hey, Let's do this thing right. Let's be fair. Um, and the timing couldn't have been better. Uh, we wound up agreeing to impose the fee, uh, and letting it go through without continuing to fight it at a time where our ride counts were lower. 
uh, and the they were willing to waive the initial um, airport fee. I'm not sure exactly how it works out in Chicago, um, but we did not have to buy, quote unquote, buy our permits as they originally had proposed. If it went through as proposed, company my size, it would have cost me $75,000 to get uh, our airport fee. I wound up walking away with zero. Um, and so did every other operator in New York and New Jersey. Um, so we're good for the next couple of years. Hopefully they don't make us then buy the permit at that point. Uh, but as it, again, association, we did it as one. No one operator could have um, achieved it. Um, and the advocacy that you know the LANJ um, has behind it, um, it's just a strength in numbers game. So I, I couldn't encourage people more to be members. And I helped uh, when it came to the permitting, I helped just as many non-members of our association get their permits. I can't tell you how many hours I spent working with non-members of LANJ to help them get their permit situation squared away at the Port Authority. And a number of them have joined. We haven't collected dues yet. We're just starting back up uh, July 1st. We suspended dues last uh, March, um, when the pandemic hit, we stopped collecting dues. Um, although the work never stopped, um, you know, we continued with our lobbyist. We continued with our executive director. Uh, those expenses never stopped. Fortunately, we had uh, some money in the bank, so we were able to carry our cash flow load each month. But it's time to start collecting dues again as we get back into business. And uh, again, I'm not sure what. Uh, your association is doing in terms of dues, but July 1st, uh, LANJ is starting to collect dues back from their, their members again, because um, the work does continue. We still have a voice in Trenton. Uh, I'm going to a dinner tomorrow night. That's $1,000 a ticket. That money doesn't come out of thin air. That comes from you know, our, our membership dues, and, and that all goes towards our advocacy. The NLA a huge partner with all the local associations. Can't stress enough how important it is for uh, the member companies of, of my association to also be members of the NLA because the NLA has a huge force behind it, a huge voice. Look at what's uh, been accomplished by the ABA and UMA. It's been an advocacy for the CERTS Act. And it, it was a grassroots effort. It was letter writing. It was phone calls to legislators. And this was a national effort. Um, and it's just starting to come to fruition right now. We should have um, the, uh, the applications, I think, will be going out sometime in the next week or so, from what I understand, um, for, uh, for the CERTS Act. So any of you that are running uh, over the road motor coaches, um, you know, you should definitely be eligible for uh, CERT Act money. Um, there is talk that even if you only have rear luggage vehicles, that you should apply also because you just don't know what they may or may not accept. So that's something I would say to everybody, you know, take advantage of it. Um, register for the CERT Act. There's a lot of information online um, and uh, go through the registration process and, and, and you know, be part of it. Thank you, Jason. I mean, so many great points that you made and it's just frightening to think that without, without your leadership, without the association and without active members being a voice for our industry, where would we be as an industry? Um, that's frightening to think of that. It, it, you know, it, it, and it's frightening to think, I mean, obviously we know we've lost members. There's no question about it. There's, uh, there's been a contraction in the industry over the last 15 months, uh, quite sadly. I mean, I know operators that have just, you know, closed the doors. Um, there's a lot of M&As going on right now. So you'll see, you know, mergers going on, acquisitions of, of companies uh, to take over because there was no other way of survival. Um, the pandemic hit everybody very, very hard, obviously. Each and every one of us has been affected and, you know, sadly has put a lot of people out of business. Uh, our association is going to suffer probably, uh, I'm estimating between 
the number of operators that we've lost and the sizes, because we charge our dues based on the size of your company, the fleet sizes have gone down enough. I think we're going to see probably a 40% reduction in our annual dues intake is what I'm budgeting right now. Yeah, I think we're very similar. Okay, at this time, we will turn it over to uh, Sarah and uh, with GCLA and the last few years, if not five or six years, GCLA, just like on the East Coast, they've been extremely busy uh, on the West Coast. So turning it over to Sarah. Um, well, I, I got this contract March 1st, 2020. <laughs> and so um, my first job was to meet with the group uh, at our legislative day, our version of Day on the Hill. And uh, en route, Gavin Newsom announced that Contra Costa County, which is the main county of San Francisco, was going to be locked down. So uh, we were at the state capitol when the very first county of the very first state announced their, their lockdown. And so the dominoes fell. So um, we had to pivot right there um, in our state capital as to our entire advocacy strategy. Um, and so the only focus really um, in the last 12 months for California has been dealing with, with this state closure and, um, but what we were prepared to do was to, to talk about Prop 22. Because Prop 22, as everyone knows, was a, a landmark case uh, that the GCLA advocacy efforts for six years won. And uh, they were successful in passing a law that um, basically um, rewrote the uh, labor um, restrictions for drivers for, for the ride hail industry, to which the ride hail industry responded with, um, we'll throw $200 million in advertising at this and we'll get it overturned at the ballot. Um, so with, that was gonna be the fight. It's still the fight, but it's, it's interesting. Karma is a B um, because what ended up happening with Prop 22, I'll, I'll digress for a second, is 50% of the Uber, and Lyft um, workforce in the state of California was treating their job as full-time. And um, they wanted to be considered employees. And the pandemic um, exacerbated that because they found out they didn't have unemployment or any uh, other benefits. Um, and so they became a burden to the state. But you know that 50% of the labor force, the driver labor force that wanted to be taking care of um, were, were, was the backbone of the ride hail business. The other 50% were the gigsters, the kids that were um, doing this like babysitting change, right? They didn't want to be obviously um, anything other than just, you know, some pocket change for weekend um, play. So you have, so, so what, what, what ended up happening with Prop 22 when it passed, you had a mass exodus of drivers in the workforce. So had the pandemic not happened, um, we would have had in the state of California an abundance of drivers to pick from um, because we couldn't offer them a job because we were all shut down um, and the longevity of the shutdown, those drivers, those career drivers um, um, moved on and probably not to be returned unless there's a reason to come back into the driving pool, but they won't come back to Uber and lift because they they didn't want um, to be independent contractors anymore. So that's significant because Uber and Lyft lost 140,000 drivers in the state of California. And um, and so they won the battle, lost the war because they can't serve, there's no on demand in the near future for Ride Hill in California. You're better off taking a taxi um, if you're in, in, a, in a hurry because they just can't, uh, they can't meet the demand. Um, so, you know, so from an advocacy standpoint, we've actually had to do nothing but sit down, sit back and kind of watch this thing play out. You know, Uber passing that law that uh, Prop 22 was endorsed by Biden and Kamala Harris. It was passed, endorsed by the Democratic Party to which the state of California is very blue. So, 
Uber, in a sense, bit the hand that feeds them, and nobody's helping them. So it's 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 going to be interesting. So um, that aside, um, as far as advocacy and as far as what I've done in the uh, short time I've been part of this organization, is really on the organizational front. <coughs> uh, we have a big state. We have 40 million residents in California. We 380 million people visit California travel in from out of state a year because it's a destination for everything for for every, every venue events weddings business uh, we have some of the most you know busy international airports in the world LAX and, and SFO so it's it's you know seventh largest economy in the world there's we lost 50 percent of our um, operators um, since March of 2020. And I know that because we're working hand in glove with the California Public Utilities Commission who gives us accurate reporting. And like as of June 1st, there were only 4,000. Um, when I walked in, there was 96 license holders. Now that included the bus industry too. Uh, those are PUC license holders. Um, there's four, just, just barely over 4,000. So 50% of the operators in the state of California have not renewed their license. Um, they're not suspended. They're not, so, so those are people that don't think they're coming back at least in this, um, this year. So we have a head count reduction of 50%. And of the survivors, we all know that everyone downsized their fleet and lost their employee pool. So they're, they're working at half capacity all the way around um, and um, there was a light switch moment where the state, you know, the governor's being recalled. So he's trying to be nice and open things up. Um, and, uh, you know, it didn't take much to overwhelm the system. We're overwhelmed. People are working 20 hour days. Um, Mo, our president, was dispatching when I tried to get a hold of him <laughs> the other day. Um, so we just don't have enough bodies, we don't have enough metal. Um, so that's the, the latest, greatest. But on the advocacy front, we a year ago, we didn't have a legislative committee. Today, we have a legislative committee. What we found, what I observed, and I observed it when working with the NLA, is you don't want it just any person representing your association on the advocacy front. 85% of our um, industry in California is in the one to four car space. So you don't want to take someone that doesn't have um, uh, experience in advocacy, experience in the industry from a big picture standpoint, experience with governance, and just throw them out there into uh, a day on the hill, for instance, um, or um, uh, speaking at an airport authority meeting, or even at, at the local level. So what we've created is a legislative boot camp. So we have we have expanded our legislative committee. It's bigger than it needs to be because um, uh, in this particular case, uh, it's kind of come one, come all with legislative. And, and we um, are kind of training the trainers. So the legislative committee is being created to train people in their backyards on, on how to conduct themselves at meetings. So it's, and it's very important. I don't have to tell you guys this. Your presentation showing up is great, but you could say the wrong things and really ruin a relationship. So it's important that people are very trained by their, your association before they go out and take the, take the microphone. Um, so advocacy boot camps. And the other thing, I'm a big relationship person. So in fact, yesterday I was on the phone with... Um, the president of the California Trucking Association, we're creating a partnership, a strategic alliance. The California Bus Association and the GCLA were on non-speaking terms for reasons. I, they have two lobbyists that don't get along. And I met with the uh, their board, and they're old. They, you know, they're they're good old boys, and uh, <laughs> you know, they're from their legacy bus people, and they hate the limo people that have taken the market share and are changing everything and disrupting and. So um, there's, there was a lot of animosity there um, and, and, uh, and we've taken a whole year, but we have um, uh, 
created a partnership with the California Bus Association. And I, I caught a break because they hired a new executive director that's an old friend of mine that worked um, uh, at MCI, handled all their marketing. So she and I worked together. She's in Illinois, uh, Chicago. Yes. And yes. Vicky, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Vicki Bowman's awesome. And, um, but partnerships, um, we uh, have a, 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 a great relationship with Cal Visit California. Visit California is a trade association made up of CVBs. So every, you know, Gilroy, California CVB, every executive director representing every town and municipality in the state of California is a member of Visit California. And Visit California promotes tourism and promotes California travel and everything else. And they didn't even know who we, nobody knew who we were. Um, we had a conference in, in March and we had the president of the Los Angeles uh, G, GC, uh, GBTA. He's also the travel manager for uh, MGM Studios, uh, Lee Palmer, never heard of GCLA. So now the Los Angeles GBTA knows us, the California, all three chapters of MPI, California know us, the California Concierge Association knows us, um, the CPUC, um, Ken and I are on, you know, speed dial, and that's the guy running the California Public Utility, he's the, that's the enforcement agency of California. Um, we had, we wrote a resolution as an association for a safety training program. Um, it's, uh, it was fast tracked to Gavin Newsom read it over the weekend and handed it off to his chief advisor who we met with Monday. We have a meeting today with his chief legislative uh, council at noon today. And these are just, um, people, um, are, and they want to know who we are. They're very curious. Um, but you know, it sounds like a big number, 4,000 owners of transportation, surface transportation providers, but it's, a, it's a, it's nothing in this state. We have no, we don't have a big enough voice if we had a hundred percent participation. So I, we have to have partnerships and it's all who, you know, um, we show up, we have an air, airport committee and we have representatives on that committee that represent San Diego. Orange County, LAX, and SFO, the key um, airports. They show up to everything, but they show up with scripts. You know, we have huddle meetings. You say this, you don't say that, you know, da, 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 da. And so they have to be mentored. And that has been very, very effective. Um, because, you know, gone are the days where you show up all pissed off. <laughs> And you're standing up there yelling at somebody with your pitchfork, you know. And so the reputation... The brand of the GCLA um, is, is what our focal point is, opening doors, building bridges, and, um, and it's really, um, it's something to behold. So it's very doable for any state to go out there and, and know your MPI people in your state, know your G GBTA people in your state, know the luxury travel industry, you know, the, I, we had this gal that spoke, <clears throat> she does bespoke weddings. She's from Orange County. And there's 3,200 wedding planners in the state of California. I didn't even know there was a sto state association for them. Um, and, and they're no joke. Like this gal that spoke is has 100 weddings booked for, for the remainder of 2021. 100 weddings and her medium budget is... 250,000, 8,000 per wedding per transportation company. So when you think about retail where business travel is stalled out right now, you know, you get a contract with a wedding planner and it's not as retail as you think, because it's like having a relationship with a travel advisor. And we think about business travel as being the end all, but the luxury travel industry is off the charts. So get to know the luxury travel associations. Um, ASTA um, is, is the big one, but they have, ASTA has um, state associations for you guys to partner with and pick up the phone and say, we wanna have a mixer with you guys. We wanna, you know, uh, we want a Zoom call. Um, 
but you know, just start with getting um, your name out there. The other thing we're doing to promote the GCLA is we are working on a video um, which, which, which has a theme called We Move California. But the GCLA has no marketing, no branding to send to California MPI. That puts a positive face on the association. So um, you have to have a great website. I mean, our website is better. We're on a shoestring budget because our membership dues are $75 a year, no matter your fleet size. And that was preset. Um, so we have, um, you know, we have, you, you have to have a nice storefront because if you're starting to build relationships, even with government officials, um, Lorena Gonzalez, who authored um, uh, Prop AB5 that turned into Prop 22, I mean, she was all over us. Want to see everything and you have to look pro. So we focused on our image and we focused on our, our creating our own advertisement as an association. Um, and you can go on our website. There, there were no bylaws that were really updated. Actually, they had the GCLA had adopted the NLA's bylaws from like five years ago. And I'm like, wait, I know the, <laughs> this bylaws. Those are Looks familiar, yeah. huh? Yeah. So we, had we, had, we, had to, we had to we had to fix the bylaws. We created a code of conduct. Mm -hmm. We had standards. You have to sign a form, and if you read it, you can get the boot um, from an association. So it's a privilege to belong. And there's consequences if you don't pay people, if you don't renew your license, if you don't maintain your insurance, you know, you, you're out. We also created, um, we created an arbitration arm. We actually have a grievance policy. You get upset about something, you can file a grievance and you go in front of a um, committee and they will arbitrate and, and rule on that um, issue. So, you know, those are things to kind of build it and they will come, but we really wanted legitimacy because legitimacy to an association and branding ties you back to those doors that we're talking about opening with all these relationships. But that's what's been really um, key for, for the GCLA and, um, and uh, super easy to replicate. Oh, Art, you're on uh, mute, Art. How, how many board members are in your association? 16. Okay. Because I know there's a lot of committees. And what are we look, we're looking like eight. I mean, I mean, you hear about all these committees and, and I mean, we don't have enough board members. Um, to actually well, run we, these different committees. We only I, have, uh, we only have board members. Um, it's a fallacy you think board members are on committees. Most trade associations, and, and the NLA fell into this trap of thinking that their board members have to not only be the committee, but actually spearhead the committee. Most associations don't burden their board with committees. Yep. Being on the board is commitment enough. Right. So most associations recruit committees from their membership. And, and we recruited and, people that ran for the board and didn't get in on the board. So we said, join a committee. Um, but we 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 go after people um, that are um, aspiring to be more involved, and we promote committee involvement, and we um, we bring, and we get people on the board to recruit. Um, but I try really hard because we ask a lot of our board. They got to take a lot of calls and sit in a lot of meetings. And so yes, they're on committees, but you know um, I I try to make sure that they're shouldered with good support so that they're not just I mean, it's volunteerism. You can really overdo it. Absolutely. So don't be afraid to get out there and, and, and reach out to other members and pull them in. And I think for us, I mean, we're growing. We're at 84 members right now, which is, um, Tracy can't remember if it's ever been that high. So we're, we're going with the historical number of 84. But for us, it, I, I mean, I look at committees as a way of bringing and people into the fold who probably don't think that they're uh, qualified enough to be on a board, but also get that exposure because we have a lot, especially during pandemic, we have not really had, aside from these calls, we haven't had any face-to-face -face meetings and probably won't till the end of the year. So another way to get people involved and start to get them comfortable 
with per perhaps becoming a director at some point is to get them on a committee. And we have, I think we have pretty, you know, pretty good resources as far as trying to uh, help them facilitate and we're willing to do that. It's really more about recruiting those individuals and giving well, them the I, tools. And, and I think that, I mean, what I've gotten out of this that, that I find is very valuable is these two associations have far reaching um, hands and they have people involved, mm -hmm. many more people involved than you know, our eight <coughs> board members are literally trying to do all of this on our own and run our companies. Yeah. And it's just not happening. And part of the reason it's not happening, and there's a lot happening, we're getting a lot done, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, you know, there's so much more that can get done if you have industry involvement. I mean, at this point, we're a limousine and bus association, and we're representing um, bus companies and limousine companies. But there's a the majority of the bus companies, you know, there's this divide that you talked about, Sarah, where, where they basically, you know, it's kind of like us against them thing. There's a divide in the industry and somehow we got to pull it. This may be an opportunity for us to pull that divide together and get these people involved just to even notify the city as to, you know, why the art, this ordinance needs to get changed. You know, there's, you know, there's, there's, people in the bus industry that are set in their ways, just like there's people in the limo industry that are never gonna be okay, never pal around with Uber or accept ride hail into their world. Um, because ride hail took a big slice out of our business travel market, you know, it hit our pocketbook. And the bus industry, you gotta, you know, I mean, it's progress, but uh, in their mind, you guys took a piece of their market share and um, why should they like you? But, <laughs> There's guys like Rob from Carrera Tours. He's 45 years, like, like I'm going for the younger guys and gals that are a little bit more open-minded and um, actually they're they're more flexible because they're not just stuck in the super coach mentality. They're also buying shuttles and they're actually kind of going mainstream whereas they're buying limo kind of equipment too. So you pick your pick your battles if you can't, get through a brick wall, pivot, and find somebody um, in the bus market that can, uh, that, that, that's more open. And um, I just, you know, and I, I work through vendors. I'm real tight with the MCI group and ABC bus and Prevo, and they just call this operator, call that operator. So lean in on your vendors. They, have, they know everybody. I mean, so, so um, I get my vendors to help me. Um, find those right relationships. We've had uh, great, some really great points, Sarah. Um, we've had uh, some of our vendor members as some of our strongest uh, board members um, that serve uh, and Same really, re really participate, really give it their all, um, attend meetings, conference calls, uh, willing to travel down to Trenton to you know, go testify. I mean, we, we, we've had a lot of support from our vendor members. Couldn't thank them enough. Uh, the point you made, Sarah, about uh, um, having the right members represent you, um, it, it's definitely a grooming thing. Um, it's, it's finding, um, it, and, and a two-car operator or four-car operator can articulate um, just as well as some of our larger operators. And my board is, is comprised of, of guys that have one car all the way up to, you know, David Seelinger from Empire CLS sits on our board. So uh, as the largest operator. So we, we cover the gamut um, of operators, uh, all, all shapes and sizes. Um, and some of our, our board members, again, started as just an operator. We got them involved in a committee, gave them, you know, some responsibility. They were able to have a voice. And then ultimately they got a seat at the table as a director. So that's a great way of getting people involved is uh, get them involved in a committee, um, see what their level of interest is, whether it's the golf committee, whether it's legislative, if they have that kind of background membership, um, you know, our, our membership committee right now is, is hitting high gear. They're going to have to get on the phone uh, to those that don't respond to the emails that are coming out about the dues and see who's still in business, who's not. And it's gonna take a grassroots effort to build the association back up. So our membership committee 
um, is definitely uh, going to be, um, you know, hitting uh, hit, hitting the road, uh, the, the ground running. Um, Sarah, a question for you. So, uh, does GCLA um, have a program for non California operators to be members of your association? So that's something we have in New Jersey. We have uh, affiliate members that belong to LANJ. Um, are you looking to attract uh, operators from New Jersey, for instance, that would become members of GCLA as an affiliate member? Anything like that happening with you? Um, oh, yeah. The, oh, when I walked into this, it, it's an open membership. Um, Out-of-state um, operators don't have um, voting rights. Um, and they don't, uh, you know, it's $75, no matter where, where you, um, come from. Um, so we don't just, we don't discriminate, but we do have a bylaw that pro, a provision that if you're, um, out of the state of California, you cannot be on the board, nor can you vote on California policy issues. So if we had to take a membership vote on, you know, should we do a, uh, a show at the Meadowlands. <laughs> I'm throwing something stupid out. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, we might I, involve I, everybody. <laughs> I, I get it, but but yeah. but 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 you allow you allow out out of state members to become members of your association. Yeah, so. I actually inherited a lot of um, you know this. Uh, there's a there's a lot of action in California, so there's a lot of people that want to be from a networking perspective want to be linked in with California. Um, Tim Rose is a perfect example. Mike Barreto is a member. Um, Bob I, I was Obama. just going to say, Sarah, you, you can sign me up today. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it would be an honor to be to be uh, yeah, a member think, of your association. You know, that's, so. a, and that's another thing. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, right now with this pandemic, I always try to figure out, you know, um, there's, there's no point in looking back. It's only looking forward. And so... Um, the, the good news is that at least I can speak to California. We hit rock bottom in February. And um, from that point forward, it didn't get any worse. It just progressively is getting better. So now we can finally focus on a recovery. And what that looks like is when you lose 50% of a market in California and they say what goes in California, there goes the country. Yes. Who do you do business with? Who's left? What kind of fleets are out there? I mean, there's nobody knows. Everybody on, on our end is calling. Are you still, you know, uh, uh, uh. and uh, and so it's networking and communication is is really important. And, and this uh, this is why I was excited about being invited to this meeting because I want to know who's out there, what's going on, and I'm can, I'm sure everybody else feels the same. So I think we should think about you know having these associations, these state associations, meet more often. Often, mm -hmm. um, because there is so much networking amongst our members. Well, um, you, and you and I have been talking about it at the executive director level a couple of times because you and I meet yeah. periodically, and we we have probably hour long. You know what's going on in your side, what's going on, and and we feel like there's there's a great opportunity even there for executive directors to really start to intermingle more um, because there are a few of us out there. And, um, uh, and some and some organizations have more resources. Uh, I got I, I just wrote two pages of notes while while Jason was talking. <laughs> so you know, in this short period of time, I just I feel so much smarter just by hearing things. Yeah. So it's really it's really important to to, to for us to um, kind of join link together. Um, I mean, the GCLA. I think we were the very first to sign up for the twenty twenty one um nla membership the the day i got the email we we paid our dues and joined because i looked and i just reached out to robert alexander who emailed me back yesterday he was we're having an expo um august 30th and 31 but the centerpiece of that meeting is super bowl 2022 which is in los angeles february 13th and you know the nfl is telling us they need 10,000 limos they're not allowing anything over a shuttle and we don't have 
5,000 in the state of California. Right. And then they're telling us, well, we need 10,000 plus nobody from out of state can come because <laughs> California is so mired in regulation and red tape. So it's, it's a hot mess. So we have the Super Bowl, let, you know, in LA, it's that brand new stadium that they just opened a week ago. Um, so we have all kinds of crazy things to talk about. And I reached out to Robert and said, you know, I haven't heard anything in limo, uh, California land from the NLA um, in this pandemic, because sometimes California is just so far off the grid <laughs> and everybody kind of writes it off. We're just that wacky state. But we, uh, we asked him if he'd come out and speak and stump for the NLA. Because um, we think we're going to get, um, this is an open meeting because it's for the Super Bowl. So we think we're going to have, and we have 1,200 operators in LA County. So we think we're going to have a lot of people there. And, I, and so he's just said, yeah, he's coming. So we're excited because I, we'll be able to get, um, you know, him um, highlighting all the stuff that's going on with the NLA. And that kind of, that's kind of the mecca of all these state organizations. That's my view. Mm -hmm. So that's exciting. But, you know, I just, I think the communication among all of us organizations is very valuable and um, very educational. Very much so. And, and as we're speaking and, and talking about, you know, the different, uh, the, either the executive directors or the, the boards of all of the different local associations is how valuable is this webinar right now, when you're talking about advocacy and what, what we're asking from our members and what it really means to be a voice, whether you're a one car operator or a 100 car operator, is how valuable would this webinar be for all of those other local associations? And that maybe we should send that link to all of the other presidents. I think we can get the president li president's list from the NLA and uh, send this link to them so that they can have the same conversations. And Sarah brought up some terrific points with uh, the networking that uh, the GCLA has done with the wedding planners and uh, the bus associates. I mean, there's just, you start to really think about the tentacles that go out and what, you know, what is a good synergy for your membership and association. And you've nailed it. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that's, that's, the, that's the route to go is to start reaching in areas that you didn't think really existed. Um, and you know what, Jason, we tell them don't do business. What we also did, and it's really cheap. We created a membership directory and put it front facing on our website. We did that because we, um, we wanted these associations to find it. So, cause we're saying don't do business with people without, you know, vetting them on our website. Yeah. So we're, we're using the GCLA as a legion and, and by making these relationships happen with MPI and GBTA stateside and, and the California Concierge Association and so forth, they're like, well, who are you? And we're like, we're, we're the good housekeeping seal of approval for surface transportation in California. And if you don't see your, your people that you're talking to on our website, that's a red flag. And they're like, whoa. And so, um, <laughs> <laughs> we put together our directory for $200 a year on Community Box. Community Box is a plug and play association directory for a subscription and you just, and it runs itself. So when people sign up for our association, we send them their little link to, to update their directory information and they go in there and they do their own thing. And, um, you know, it's hands-free for us, but, but we put it front facing um, for that strategic reason, so that when um, when anybody wants to vet somebody and they don't see them as a GCLA member, they go back to that person and say, well, you, how come you're not a GCLA member? And then we get a call <laughs> and the beat goes on. I, I mean, it, it's, it, it's a seal of approval. It's great. Um, I personally will not do business in New Jersey with a non- uh, LANJ member. I will not farm to, you know, to a, another operator that's not a member of our association. We've gotten a lot of pressure put on other members and that's how we've gotten quite a few people to join. Because mm -hmm. if you want my business, you're in New Jersey, pay the darn fee. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a minimal fee. Uh, it's as low as 
fourteen dollars a month, and it goes up to. Uh, I mean, we have operators that pay two thousand dollars a year. Um, I mean, that that's our top end um, for the larger operators. So we have a scale, of, you know, that ranges anywhere in between. We'll hit your credit card every month. Um, it kind of on, is on autopilot, um, but that's how we've gotten you know some members to to join is that pressure of you want that seal of approval you want to do i want i personally as president and but also as an operator only want to do business with people that support us you support me i support you and that's how we've gotten also a lot of uh, our vendor our, i'm sorry our uh, affiliate members uh, windy city happens to be a affiliate member of LANJ they pay membership dues to belong to LANJ cuz LANJ members want to send business to people that become members of their association. So it's a reciprocal kind of relationship. Um, is it forced? It's not forced, but um, I wish we look for that. People like to do business with other NLA members. I couldn't encourage people more to be, uh, especially right now, um, to be members of the NLA. Uh, definitely, definitely. And the other thing too, um, uh, just another trick of the trade is and you can take this to the NLA, Tracy, but date your logos so that they have to renew them because you can see people don't, they get, they met, they join and they haven't been a member for five years. I mean, we tracked down a lot of those GCLA um, oh, hanger right. honors that weren't paying. And so we just, we just talked to Curtis Gabriel and said, here's our logo. Could you put a proud member and the date and, and, and wrap it around the logo? for you know 50 bucks and um you know now when we reset when sign people up we have a new logo every year and then have and a, cease and a cease and desist letter uh to send out to people that are using your logo uh, that are no longer members and, uh -huh. and i can't well, tell you i mean how many times i've seen it posted on facebook um that you know so and so is is not an nla member but they still have it on their website that they you are. can't get it off either. We, we used to do that, you know, threaten them. So we date it now. And then, you know, if they, if, if it looks old, it, it's an embarrassment. So, okay. So you're a proud member of the GCLA 2009. I mean, we, it's 2021. We What's have such limousines on them that are from the, from the year 2000. And, uh, but we, we're excited because we're going to be um, uh, putting up a new website in the next month. And the, because we're changing the, the, the domains, that will disconnect all of them from that. But I agree with you. Um, when our 35th anniversary comes up this year, we'll be definitely, next year, we'll be definitely putting dates on it because- I, I love the logo idea. That's a, that's a great idea. Awesome, yeah. Because I mean, there are a lot of people that I-, I We have to get, I mean, desperate times cause for desperate measures. And we just, I mean, 75 bucks. So, um, so I think I, I think that dates back three years ago, where somebody on the board said, you know, what if we just almost make this free, um, because they were fixated, as they should be, on the head count. Because I agree with Jason, it's not your fleet size; it really is how many people you embody. Um, at least from a government standpoint, they want to know what your sphere of influence is as an organization. So we. Somebody said, well, if we just ratchet down the price, you know, the floodgates were open, but, you know, we didn't have any member services. We didn't have any way to communicate. We didn't have the follow-up after we discounted the price. So um, we're kind of stuck now, you know, with this, with this low ball price and we have to figure out how to um, upsell our members but we can't upsell them if we don't have any value and we everything we're doing has to have a value to it including the logo the logo has an intrinsic value people sign up just for that legitimacy and why have it not date and expire when their membership expires love that yeah i i i'll, I'll take a page from the tom mazza may you rest in peace playbook mm. um and this, this is kind of counter to uh, what we're saying right now, but just being a member doesn't necessarily mean that you are fully insured and a good operator. Just because I paid my dues um, doesn't mean that um, I'm the right guy to do business with. So it doesn't, st you still need to do your due diligence um, and not just 
throw a dart at the NLA um, um, book and say, hey, they're members of the NLA, so I can do business with them. No, you still need to do your, your, your due diligence. Um, so I encourage people to do that as well. well Be a member you, for sure, no question you, about it, but also just make sure that you know you do your due diligence with who you do business with. So, Jason, do you um, require that they put um, their license? See, we require on our membership uh, that they put their PUC license. And then the PUC gives us a printout, and we can see who's suspended, who's active, who's Unf revoked. Unfortunately, in New Jersey, uh, we're not quite as sophisticated as that. <laughs> uh, New York has TLC, um, so they're able to get that. Uh, New Jersey, there's no quote unquote licensing. Um, I'm hoping one day to become the New Jersey TLC commissioner. Um, <laughs> once, once, once they form that position, I can retire. And, Wait, and that's shocking to me that New Jersey doesn't have. There's nothing. There's what? absolutely nothing. Um, I did not know that. Yeah. It's kind of crazy with as, as large of a population that we have in New Jersey and the amount of companies, the amount of vehicles. I mean, we, we're numbering in the four or 5,000 vehicle range, um, or at least pre-pandemic, um, that we represented that um, there's no governing body. The, wow. Each company gets their license from the town to then go to Motor Vehicle Commission to get their plates, but there's no company license per se um to get oh wow so how uh, about how about in illinois do you guys have to have a special license you only for the city of chicago and then after that um you and you're if you're outside of the chicago limits you don't need a license you just need to be registered you know a registration in that plate but even in the city of chicago it's just for the vehicles you just have to have a vehicle plate approved by the city of chicago and the chauffeurs have to have a city approved license to operate in the city of Chicago. But as far as the company itself, yes, you have to be approved to have your plates registered, but there really isn't not like California with the PUC or the or the TLC in New York, we don't have that either. So you don't have to prove your um, $1.5 million. I mean, we have to prove workers comp. We have to prove um, our 1.5 million liability insurance policy before we can get an application um, through the PUC, so you guys. So we, we have do. to do that in order to get our plates. And we okay. have. If we wanted to look up a single license for a company, you would literally see all of their plate numbers. You wouldn't see like a license number for oh. a company. And this, and they do this like in the city. They require you to show proof that your company is in good standing with the state. So you do yeah. have to go through that criteria. You can't. You you know. You provide that information. They verify it, but. It's, it's really limited. Um, but once you're outside of Chicago, it's pretty simple. Uh -huh. Past practice in New Jersey, we have asked for your certificate of insurance um, as part of your application package. We asked for your DOT number. Uh, it, it lost its formality over the years mm. um, in terms of verifying people's existence. <laughs> Yeah. Um, unfortunately. And, and they did that. They did that with the WLA too, because I'm on their board. And um, re as recently as a couple of years ago, we decided to stop doing it because um, it seemed a bit intrusive since we were a trade association. And I mean, I, I think going back to an earlier point that Jason made was, you know, when we tell members, yeah, great. Now you see that you can work with each other. We still tell them they have to vet them out just like anything else they would do. Yeah, and I know in Kansas City, pretty much the only, the only agency that I mean, if you're within the city of Kansas City, Missouri, there's city licenses. But um, as far as everyone else, the airport's the only one that checks it out. And quite honestly, the airport doesn't check it out because there are people that are still registering vehicles up there with inactive DOT numbers with uh, without their motor carrier authority. They even had a. Um, like one of those uh, investigative reports from one of the TV stations here in town about a company that was copying, they were cro uh, cloning other legitimate companies' websites. Um, Diane with Overland happened to be one that got caught in the crosshairs with this, this guy. Mm -hmm. He was taking their money. He did have a car registered at the airport, but it was AAA insurance. 
And when, when the uh, investigative report went to AAA, they're like, we don't do commercial insurance and that's not even a valid policy number. Our policy numbers don't even look like that. So, I mean, the airport, they don't even verify that your information is correct. They just want a sheet of paper that says you have insurance. They don't verify whether or not it's a valid insurance policy. You don't have to have an airport permit to get in your airport? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that we do have an airport permit that's based on the vehicle, and then the drivers have to go through a fingerprint background check. But with the airport permit, you walk in, you know, you can have DOT paperwork, but you know, my DOT paperwork that says I've got an active motor carrier number hasn't changed since I started my company 13 years ago. It's the same piece of, it's the same piece of paper that says I have, I have operating authority. They don't go into the safer system and verify that it's, you know, still a valid number. They don't call the insurance company to verify the insurance. You know, you just have to provide proof of insurance, which anyone could easily make up because it's, you know, the forms look, you know, uniform. Oh, that's shocking. That's terrible. Yeah. yeah. So, as, as I mentioned before, sir, we just started in New Jersey, New York and New Jersey, with the three New York area airports of having an airport fee. And now this has got my wheels turning in terms of maybe Lange should require uh, proof of your airport uh, port authority registration. This can now be um, the legitimacy. Um, thing that we need to ensure that we have operators that are operating legally in the state of New Jersey. Uh, do you what? still, that's a good idea. Do you still um, work with your, um, I remember Lange used to do these um, sting operations with the police force working um, in partnerships. Yeah, that, I mean, that's something that happened umpteen years ago um, that, 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 that has stopped, that practice has stopped. Um, we didn't do you have like, an illegal do you have an illegal operator problem anymore that you have to do that kind of stuff so <laughs> unfor unfortunately the deregulation um that transpired to allow the tncs to operate in the state of new jersey has de uh de legitimized um a lot of operators there are people that have taken their livery plates off the vehicles you, you have you have lincoln town cars showing up at the airport um, which is regular passenger plates on the vehicles. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy for them to just say, hey, I'm doing an Uber ride. Um, you know, but that's, but that's across the board too. You have that problem at O'Hare too. I mean, I, even in the party bus industry, you have people that are going out and getting RV plates for their party buses and, you know, and running those. It's, it's not unique to New York or New Jersey or, you know, Michigan. It is, it is a systematic problem across the country that, you know, there, there's not really any, any enforcement that goes on and the enforcement that goes on is the people that are trying to be legit that have their DOT numbers because they're on the radar. Yeah. Now, I would also say that any, any association that is acting as a regulatory body confirming that you have your airport license, that you're insured um, is creating a liability for their association. A, because, a, a huge you know, one. Somebody can have that operating authority today and lose it tomorrow and something bad happens. And because the association says that they had it and I booked it based on the information I got from the association, it will association test our DNO policy. Liability. I, I, that, that is a great point, Art. It is um, but how does, now, now let me ask you, because there are other, there are other trade associations or other associations like there, like you can't be a member of the Realtors Association unless you're a licensed real estate agent. But that's a conflict yeah. of interest kind of thing. And well, you could you could you could take you could take your your website and have the operators upload certificates proof of insurance on their own as mm -hmm. their statement of proof of insurance and who they have. Um, so that basically we could say, okay, you know, these are our companies and they are submitting their proof of insurance. And they upload their own proof of insurance to their profile on the website, and at that point. You know, it's something that we're not no. checking. But, 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 but as you know, Art, it, it, you know, you can get canceled the month later too for not paying your premium. But at the oh. same time, also, I'm also not a big fan of this. And Michael, I think can can back me up on this one. If you have, you know, your proof of insurance out there with your with your policy number, you can have someone file a claim against you without being involved. I mean, they've got your information in and. They can they can file a claim against you anyways. We just I, I just got a letter yesterday 
from someone that fell on a bus in a casino that we have a contract yeah. for before we ever had the contract. The, yeah, the but I'm saying, like, let's not make it, let's, let's not make it any easier for them by giving them the information that they need in order to follow. Them. Well, you know, back, backing up the whole situation, I think it's going to be an individual association um, plan and expectations as to how far they can go with validation and all that. I mean, I personally, I come from the Blue Cross Blue Shield family. And so, I mean, that is a true compliance organization. You paid to be compliant. We audited the shit out of you. And if you didn't do it, we tell you, we fined you a hundred to half a million dollars. But that was, had specific guidelines for being a member. You had to do certain things. You had to use the brand a certain way. Um, you could not, you know, conflict of interest were validated. We're not that kind of industry. We're not a regulatory, you know, um, you know, situation. So it, it, it's very, it's easy to say, you know, do this, check this, check that. I think our best defense is a good offense, educating our members to do it themselves. And that's what myself, Tracy, our, all, of, all of our executives are doing. They and then having, and having a policy in place to remove people from your association that are in violation, because you'll have whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. We have no shortage of people that tell us who's doing, I mean, we have it easy in California because of the licensing. All I have is, first of all, we have annualized licensing. And so the minute somebody doesn't pay their insurance, PUC is notified, their accounts flagged and suspended. And then I'm, you know, it, I, it's, but, it's but, real time. So, so the, the PUC is so doing my work for me. Right. And all I have to do is look at it, you know, and so. Sarah, uh, and and that's, that's great because you know that you're in California, but you know, the guy that is running, you know, in Cincinnati, Ohio, that's, you know, a one or two car operator might not know anything about what California does and therefore ends up, you know, going to Google, it doesn't use the GCLA website to, you know, to vet any of this information out and ends up hiring someone who doesn't have that licensing or anything. I like just that. got an email from a woman last night um, giving me a negative report on an operator that uh, was not COVID compliant, didn't have running water in the bathroom of the bus, didn't have sanitizers, didn't have, the bus was in shambles. Um, didn't run right, you know, the whole litany of complaints. And, you know, I said, look, um, here's the number to report the company to, but they're not a member of our association. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. We get those a lot. The, and yeah. that's just, you know, and that's just it is that, you know, for someone that's in a different state or, you know, or isn't a large operator that sends a lot of work to California that, you know, they may not understand that, you know, that that's the way that California works. I mean, you know, okay. I think you are out in California and you were surprised by how, you know, there are no, there's no state regulatory body for New Jersey. Yeah, I'm shocked. Yeah. I mean, New, so, I mean, New Jersey is a, a large state and it's, you know, there's a lot of um, interstate, uh, intrastate commerce. No, it's interstate, excuse me, um, going back and forth to, to New York. So I'm, I'm really surprised that, that there isn't something more affirmative in New Jersey. Um, good thing that Jason will be changing that. <coughs> you know, I just want to maybe pull us back for about 10 seconds because we were talking about associate members and all that. Because we are bordering Illinois, uh, Illinois borders Indiana and Wisconsin, um, one of the things that we are starting to do is reach out to the other. Uh, some have associations, some do not. Many, many of them have been joining as associate members. We have two on here right now we're sharing with them any regulations that would fall on them if they happen to be doing work in our area. And I think that's been valuable. We have a number of Wisconsin operators who come here. Lynn's in the Davenport, Iowa area, and she's on here and she comes to Chicago often. Um, because for us, um, part of that advocacy also has to be sharing information so that when they come to Chicago and they show up at, they show up at the airport and they're stopped because they don't have their tax number. Um, it, it's a legitimate concern and the city of Chicago does not care that they're from Iowa or they're from Wisconsin or they're from Kent. They don't care. They want everyone to be ta have a tax number and pay taxes. And it sounds goofy as heck, but that's kind of what we deal with here. So for us, that far reaching, you know, additional layer of going out there and saying, hey guys, don't forget you, 
when we come to the airport, you're probably going to get stopped. And most of them are like, yeah, tell us what we have to do. So, um, but I, I think, I, I think going back to, you know, the, how to verify whether or not someone's legit, you know, mm. I think we need to have really a session and this may be something future that we can do. How do you appropriately vet those companies that you're going to work with? And then also put on the association websites in order to work in this market or in order to, you know, this is what you need. You need to have your city of Chicago. If you're within Chicago, you need to have your, you know, your Illinois forms. You need to have your USDOT forms if you're going across state lines. And this is how you can verify whether or not they're a legitimate company. Because if you're going across state lines, you have to have DOT with a motor carrier and you can verify, you know, what level of insurance they should have and, you know, and, and create videos that shows the, you know, the customer and in some cases, that customer may be another limo service, maybe another chauffeur transportation service, but shows them how to verify whether or not, you know, this is a legitimate company that, that has the proper paperwork in, in place. Yeah. Well, I think, I, 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 I think it starts with um, having recourse in your association. So you get a member that um, dots their I's and crosses their T's and gets accepted as uh, an association member and then let's something lapse. Um, you know, you, you have to be able to have a policy in place, um, whether it's an ethics committee, which we created an ethics committee um, because we have other policies, not just legitimacy of, of operations, but you cannot not pay somebody. We do tons of farm in and farm at work with each other in California. Yeah. yeah. And you cannot not pay somebody because you don't feel like paying them. So, so we do have arbitration and dispute resolution. Um, and uh, so, so we have other things involved with maintaining a membership, but we're, we're, we had to have the cojones to pull memberships if you're not living up to those standards. And so it, it comes from within, you have to, can't, you can't be so numbers driven and so concerned about um, being liked that you don't have um, recourse for members that are violating your code of conduct or, or standards, kick them out. You'll see morale boost. You will see people take notice to that and start to clean up their own um, store, if you will. Um, so it, it, there's, there, it, it's very important to have an association that has policy to be a member. So you're not just cashing checks. Yeah, you know, one, so there's something that, that I tried doing or tried getting moving a long time ago, and I don't know what the value would be. I think it would be high. Most people join these our associations as a way to make their businesses better. A uh, number of you, probably about three years ago, I started talking to Amir with Grid about building a Illinois, um, a limousine association site that would act as an on-demand tool so that all of the association members that have cars available could make their cars show on a map so that if I needed a car right now at Midway Airport, I can look at that map and see who's, who's in the association and at Midway Airport. And the, the extension of that process would be to extend that to other city, other state associations so that a Los Angeles association member could look for a Illinois association member who could then look for a New Jersey association member or New York association member and, and kind of have these, have a, a grassroots exchange of work between the local association members. Um, he's building a badge actually to put on, on the, um, cause I talked to him last week, he's building like a badge that associations could uh, uh, assign to anyone who's a member. And if they're on GNET, then they could be displayed and can show their badge. You, so then you'll be able to, you'll be able to, um, so in other words, if I, if I had a job going to New Jersey and I wanted to send, send it to a New Jersey affiliate, that, that's part of the New Jersey Association, I can pull up on grid and see membership in, in New Jersey? Yeah, something to that effect, yeah. That's something that I think we want to follow through on and maybe refine it a little bit. Yeah. Because I think that, for us as an association, gaining membership 
and giving membership work within the association from our association and other local associations would be extremely beneficial. Yeah, he's just, he's, we only had, we had one call a couple of weeks ago and the concept of the badge, it sounds pretty slick. Um, we'd have to really have a few associations talk about how that would be managed and, um, you know, effective date, end date, you know, because obviously you don't want stuff sitting out there and not matching up with our active membership and stuff. So it does need a little bit of polishing, but um, it, it does, it definitely can be done. Um, it's interesting to me um, how the GCLA um, does have that um, advocacy um, and uh, judge, jury, and executioner type uh, situation. <laughs> um, you know where where you're you're trying to help arbitrate uh, amongst operators. Um, it's kind of a difficult situation to put yourself in. And and, and Sarah, as you know uh, from the NLA, the NLA had that many many years ago. Um, well, what they didn't people what they, still look what, people still look to the NLA and say how do you have this other NLA operator and I can't get paid from him? Mm -hmm. um, well, they had the ethics committee, but they didn't have the second step, which I tried um, unsuccessfully because Dawson was ethics chair. Um, he took it over for Jim Mosley. Um, and both of them said, you know, we've lost all faith in human kind. <laughs> but, but the argument to disband the ethics committee was why have a committee when we have no teeth? So you have to have the policy, the NLA um, under Scott Solombrino um, took off the code of conduct. So you have to have a code of conduct. You have to have a violation in order to have um, a, a, a consequence to that violation. And so you have to put a standard there. And then you have to have your ethics committee evaluate, you know, put the, uh, it, manage that process. So you get a, you get a grievance and Jason is upset because Sarah stiffed them. Mm -hmm. So Jason says, I'm going to file a grievance against you. It gets to the ethics committee. They call Jason. What say you, they call Sarah, what say you, and they arbitrate. And it's like, looks like, um, you know, this is a 50, 50 because Jason screwed up here and Sarah screwed up there. And there was a communication gaffe. So we're going to, we're going to make a, a determination that, you know, this is our recommendation, take it or leave it. Or Jason says, you know, I want to file a grievance against Sarah for this violation. And the ethics committee says, well, this turns out to be true. And, uh, and uh, we side with Jason. And if you don't rectify this situation by doing A, B, or C, you're suspended. Mm -hmm. And we've taken oh, action. Sure. We've taken action three times in the last year. One was a very high profile board seat that was, um, this person was removed from our uh, executive board over a, a code of conduct violation. So it does, it, 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 you have to, it wasn't, it was very painful. The abundsment committee was made up of two of this guy's best friends. And so for them to have the steel spine to, to actually follow through um, was was really tough, but you know, um, it probably will be the last time for a long time because it resonated um, with with the organization. I'm sure it did. So that, that's the time. Have, Go ahead. Do you have some type of disclaimer they sign when they join that says, okay, listen, I understand that if if, if I don't pay someone or they don't pay me, my membership in this association is going to allow this group, the, this committee within the association to determine fault and make judgment and I will honor that judgment. And I'll hold the, and it will not hold the association at harm in any way for- I'll, I'll let you read your, you can, you, you can go on gcla.org and download everything that we've created. We've created a standard for being a member this is the criteria. I promise to uphold these. It's a pledge. Mm -hmm. So if somebody files a grievance, we have to match it with a violation within our membership. We can't just say, you know, oh, you know, this guy called you an asshole. So therefore, um, so we, the grievance has to log into this, this, this company 
did not pay me, or this company is operating with suspended licenses right, right. In, in San Francisco. So it has to match up with an agreement, and then there is some due diligence. Mm -hmm. We have to talk to, we have to fact check this and to the best of our ability and come to a conclusion. And if that conclusion, they, you know, arbitrating an association membership just means you're either suspended or revoked forever. You know, we only have the power of membership. Right. So we can't turn you into the police, but we can say you're out of our organization because we think that we do find that you violated this Right. This, this caveat to our membership. So, so, so it, it's the whole package. So, um, you know, we could have, we could, we could disseminate this or you could go on GCLA.org. It's, it's somewhere it's mm -hmm. under either membership tab or leadership tab, but where's our code of conduct and standards um, on our website? Uh, on the uh, it's on join. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, it, it shows you what you're getting yourself into. Does your, right. do you have a, anyone who is part of that uh, decision process or review process that is outside of the board of the, of the GCLA itself, like a third party? From uh, two third parties. One is my husband who oh. is a, a Naval officer and he jumps in as an arbitrator. He doesn't have any, uh, he doesn't have any say but the other one is we just, and this just was fluke. There's a guy on our board that used to own a limo company down in Peru, okay. who's um, an, an attorney. His name is um, Patrick O'Brien. Oh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, sorry, it's O'Brien from Peru. <laughs> Patrick O'Brien um, was from Napa Valley, but for some reason he was down in Peru running a limo company. Wow. Um, in another life. Um, but when I inherited this board, he was a vendor member on the board. Um, his brother is Robert O'Brien, the former national security advisor to Trump. Um, so, so I called him and I said, what are you doing on our board as a vendor member? He said, I just have a passion for the industry and a bunch of friends in the industry and I do pro bono work la 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 and uh and i said well you know we could and, and back in the nla um, a million years ago with the nla we had this guy ray who was from the insurance industry that was on our board and he was probably one of the most valuable memorable board of directors like that guy i'm like just give him a permanent seat because he was just a walking encyclopedia with insurance policy and and stuff and so this was kind of the same thing. It's like, should we just have him as a board elected seat, not a member, a vendor member, because he has, uh, we get free legal advice. So we're lucky in that he accepted, we rewrote the bylaws last summer and wrote him in as a uh, attorney, uh, 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 um, board, like an advisory role. And you know, if you have a relationship with attorneys and you want to create, that's another thing, creating advisory boards. We have advisory boards that, that um, involve people beyond um, our board's um, uh, capabilities. So you, you, can, you can use your resources uh, and connections and, and put together your own advisory boards that involve uh, legal counsel and they'll do pro bono work and just let let you look they'll give you um, a once over but we use Patrick now to approve every contract we rewrote our affinity program because there wasn't really anything documentable and when you think about partnering with vendors and they you know um, they uh, they take over your logo. They take, you know, you, when you partner with somebody, you partner, it's a marriage. So we wanted to tighten up some of our other things, but we, um, we have an attorney and we get free, free advice. So you don't need board of director. In, I, in I, think, I think a great takeaway from this right now, um, as we're all experiencing in our own individual businesses, and as, as associations is, you know, we're looking at the great reset of 
you know, 2021, 2022, as we start to get back into um, restarting. And that's kind of the theme of the upcoming show for Driven NLA show in Dallas is the great reset, um, how we're getting back into business. And here's a great opportunity, I think, for all associations um, to rethink um, how they want to conduct business. And I think there's been some great points that have been brought up on this call today. Um, I mean, we kind of digressed a bit from, uh, you know, our original theme of, of advocacy, but uh, it, it all dovetails back into creating the best associations that we possibly can um, mm -hmm. that are going to be strong and that are going to have, um, you know, the sea legs to really get the work done that needs to be done to be able to advocate for your own association in your state capital to make sure that your rights are protected, um, that they're not being violated, that uh, the uh, rules and regulations don't become oppressive um, as what's happened in Chicago with this security guard nonsense. Um, you know, it's gotten to the point where it's ridiculous, like it's affecting school trips. Yes, I could see a bachelor party why uh, you may want a, a security guard, you know, required on a, on a bus, but on, a, you know, a group of sixth graders going to uh, a camp, uh, no, <laughs> um, you, you've overstepped there. So um, this is a great opportunity, you know, for all associations to um, restart, reset, rethink, redo your bylaws if, if that's what it takes. Um, really rethink how, you know, how you want to reshape your association going forward. Yeah. Do, do you guys think um, that, you know, we haven't really had any, um, we haven't had an association congress or anything with the NLA facilitating for quite some time. This would be, I mean, what we talked about today, there's so many associations that could totally benefit from it. And um, do, you, do you see any uh, possibility of doing that? I mean, like I said, Sarah and I talk about just about every month, sometimes more than an hour. And we touch on a lot of the stuff that we touched on here today, just to keep ourselves up to date. But, but every time we end the conversation, pretty much, the, the, we, we both say, wow, we really need to get more people involved. Wow, it would be great if other people here heard our conversation and got something, you know, some value from it. And uh, that, that to me, uh, it, this really is kind of the offshoot of ag advocacy, but the problem is if we're not structured right, we can advocate for all we want, but it's always gonna be the same handful of people until we have the infrastructures in place to show that this is a great way to, get involved yeah don't use that one that's not even that's not even a good website yeah, I, I think with the con congressional association of presidents that we do at the show each year i think we could easily do that on zoom and surprisingly mm -hmm. enough that we haven't done it during covid but that's definitely something i think we could start and just have the executive directors or the presidents or even the board of directors you know on zoom and just kind of having the same type of conversations and really center on a particular set of topics because um, there's a lot, I took so many notes, I'm on my fourth page. So, um, just make sure to, you know, the, the, the inclusion of the executive directors, um, if you have one is good because mm -hmm. like Rick Schlage from NILA, um, you know, he's just been around forever. And, uh, so when you have these president's meetings, you're, 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 you've got some legacy in Intel, Patty, um, I've been around for 28 years. Um, Paula, you're, you're, you know, you too, you've been, you know, you know everything. And so sometimes the presidents, um, we, we cut ourselves short by not expanding those invites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Tracy, you happen to be the person that can get this done. <laughs> I think I can do that. I, I think it just rolled sideways. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, I, I think I can get that done. I'll put some uh, I'll put some feelers out there, and uh, I think that's pretty easy to coordinate. And I, I just think the other associations are yearning for this information, and yeah. it's encouraging when you hear others like you know listening to everything that Sarah's working on and how she's branching out to these other areas that we haven't explored. It's extremely encouraging, and it it gives you hope for we're so much more than just transportation. And I think in this yeah, the, group, we're all- The other thing- Go ahead. The other thing I wanna say to um, both of you and Jason is, um, you know, like there, 
when we talk about strength in numbers, um, the, the urge to create all these other associations where you can't really keep them afloat, like Seattle reached out to me and Portland and said, can you open up associations in our state? And um, no, yeah. there, there's just Seattle and there's nothing in between. So what we could do though, is we could create chapters where we, sh you know, have, we share um, lobby, lobbyists, you know, we share resources so that we get a little bit more money like you could do the same thing jason with prla instead of them operating as an independent body maybe bring them in as a chapter share resources um uh and um you know in areas like the midwest where you can't really justify a trade association in the state of indiana per se you could do a ilba chapter Mm -hmm. and share resources, um, operating costs, membership recruitment costs, counting, you know, one filing, things like that. Um, I, 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 I might be fighting some ego uh, situations with the PRLA. Yeah, I don't think we'll In all serious though, I mean, yeah, uh, Johnny, it, and, and this is not a shot at, at any of them, but um, Johnny Donnie, who happens to sit on the LANJ board as an ad hoc uh, board member. So he's invited to all of our board calls um, and he has an opportunity to speak what's going on in, you know, in the, in the Philadelphia region, but he does participate um, as a, an ad hoc board member of LANJ. Um, we have that reciprocal relationship. Um, with That's that. good. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had we had to fight the uphill battle. The, the state of California had three um, opposing associations, and uh, and you know, Northern California doesn't think they're part of the state. You know, so there's a huge division, um, and somehow, some way, these guys pulled it off to where they have one state association with chapters. It's not easy because we have the ego situation, and we have people feeling like they're not getting enough attention in this neck of the woods. So yeah, it's a balancing act, but. That, but that, that's, that's, something, that's something that Lange fought for many years. And, and this, this went back to, you know, long before I became president. But, and, and I think we've righted the ship, truthfully, in New Jersey. Um, and, and I say this very openly. Um, you know, when, we, when the directors go into the boardroom, we check our egos out the door. And each and every board member, whether you're the 500 car operator or you're the three car operator, your vote counts the same. And your voice is just as important, um, and that's something that you know we've really pushed for, and, and I'm proud of it. That uh, you know our association does function in that fashion. That each board you know director has an equal voice, equal vote, and respect, because um, the, the everybody does truthfully check their egos out the door. It's not, you know, it's not a, an ego situation there. We, we really respect each other and. Um, everyone just really gets along very nicely, which is good. Unfortunately, there's always, as in any association, I know you guys will all agree with it. There's always the handful of people that carry all the water though. And that's, yeah. um, you know, a big problem. And it's just, it's an engagement thing and it's delegation and trying to get people more involved, um, mm -hmm. you know, to help out on, on committees and to, you know, be more involved. Well, I had to reach out to Tammy Carlisle and recruit her from Atlanta to be on our fundraising committee. I had to reach out to Tiffany Hinton. She's not a business owner. She works for Robert Gaskell, but she owned an event company to put her on our programs committee. So, so you know, we had to, we had to, you know, desperate times cause call for desperate measures. But it was the best thing I ever did. That's the other thing, not just saying. Um, you're going to do this and you're going to do this. I passed, I created this committee sheet and I passed a sign up sheet around to the membership and said, sign up. And they picked what they wanted or what they thought they were good at. So that's the other thing, creating committees based on talent and based on um, the realities um, is, is you're going to get more um, work out of people if they're allowed to pick what they're good at or what they're interested in. Um, but I see a lot of state associations over the years come and go. And it's always the small associations that want to have a voice in their backyard, but don't have enough 
um, critical mass to pay for the right infrastructure to be organized and to keep the communications going. That's why I was thinking, you know, like the Midwest, there's just so many dots that could be part of the ILBA that, you know, maybe you could create chapters. Mm -hmm. And stop. So, remember, I, just pull, pull resources from an operating standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. So I will work on that as I'll work on, I'm going to kind of cut this video down and use it as a link, but to contact all of the association presidents and yeah. and just see what they think. And, but I think that would be a great idea if we all had a monthly call and being on Zoom, that just makes it so easy. So I will definitely work on that. And I, we had no idea that this was going to go two hours. Um, <laughs> I we want to thank you, uh, Jason and Sarah for all of your information and sharing. I think this was a wealth of information. You know, I wish we would have had more attendees, but I know that everyone is out driving or they're dispatching. Yes. And uh, so you can't knock that. Um, so glad to see that work has come back. Um, so Paula, did you have anything else that we needed to bring up? Um, no, because we don't have enough members to tell them that we'll be reaching out for them to help advocate for the ordinance. So I'll take that offline and push something out. I already talked to Kai about it already and, um, I have to get to Travis, but the rest, I'll, I will blast something out. Um, we, we are faced with a very short timeline to get our, uh, the changes for the uh, potential changes to the bus, uh, the charter sighting or party bus ordinance, if you will, um, passed. And the first first hurdle for us is going to be the uh, licensing committee on Thursday. And we're right now working on a written statement. And then um, the following week, the 23rd is the full city council. And this is a very big initiative. It has 95 pages of finance changes, operational changes, relaxing, fines with the city relaxing, background checks, all kinds of stuff in here. So um, we're like that little ship in the big, you know, in the big ocean. And so um, keep us all in your thoughts and fingers crossed because this is going to be one, one amazingly fast um, and one amazingly uh, crazy uh, advocacy effort in the next seven days. And thank you all for staying on so long. And this, I, this conversation was great. And Sarah and I have always, we, every conversation we end, we say, we need to get everything together. We have, we have been meeting, we get on the phone every month, every month or uh, thereabouts for the last several months since she became uh, ED at uh, GCLA. And we have, we end the conversation the same way every single time. Um, not that we didn't. Well, I, I, I have a call with, uh, with Patty Nelson uh, right now at one o'clock. Uh, and I will mention to Patty, um, yeah you know, about possibly joining a uh, director's call association, whatever, whatever you guys want to put together. But I, I think it is a great opportunity for the executive directors to get together um, as a group to uh, talk about, you know, what's facing each association and, you know, bounce ideas off each other. So I, I'll mention it to Patty. I also think that in the process of doing this, if you could make these calls uh, accessible to membership of all associations mm -hmm. where they can join in and, and see it and hear it, but maybe not participate, yeah. um, it may be beneficial to membership too to see what's going on in the background. What we found with our association, there's a lot of, lot of people that are members and non-members that literally have no idea what we're doing. I mean, Art, I, no I, I, I've, I've joined background. your calls before. Yes. Uh, I mean, Paula does put out on Facebook uh, and, and Tracy, you know, that the the association is having a coffee with, um, you know, your association, you know, when you do have the meeting. So I've joined, I've seen it, um, you know, right. firsthand and, and, and been, you know, had the honor of, of, of joining the call. So you guys do a great job in, in, in getting them out there. Like I said, right now, getting people to join and to take time away, you uh, there's probably a lot of people behind the wheel right now who are sitting behind three screens trying to put the pieces of the puzzle um, together right. or play a game of Jingle Jangle. Um, so the pieces <laughs> and, don't I, fall. and that's all true. The problem is that the lot, you know, what's going on reg in the regulatory side isn't going to stop and wait until we all get caught up and it's a moving target, yeah. you know? So, it, but, but it doesn't stop. And that, that, that's okay. the problem, Paula. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the legislature continues to work um, while we're all banging our heads against the wall trying to cover work. 
Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I've been behind the wheel of a right. motor coach more times over the last couple of weeks than I care to admit. Oh my um, gosh. I, I've had to do what I've had to do. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's just one of those things. Uh, I, I don't put myself above, above doing that. Right. So uh, yeah. everybody's work hard at work and um, we're getting back in the, back into the swing of things. So uh, I'm going to drop off now. I appreciate yeah. Thank you so Thank much you for having everybody. me. Um, yeah. Thank you. Great Thank you. to see everybody. Uh, Thank you everyone. It was great to connect. Awesome. Thank you. Can't wait to see you. Sarah, it was nice seeing you we'll as always. Again. Thank you. It's yes. great Thank to see you. Sarah. Best to you. Guys. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.